Welcome back to this week's paper review. So thank you to anyone who joined us last week for the uh, 10 best drugs stick for Olympic weightlifting. If you are new to the paper review and we kind of reeled you in for that, welcome back again to this week. We hope you enjoy them. So they're not all as uh, as juicy as last week's one. Very often they're just a lot more practical. So if you're joining us again, thanks for watching. Um, so this week's one is kind of a practical one for a lot of our coaches out there or for any of our real athletes playing sports and you're trying to determine how do I know basically if my strength and conditioning work is carrying over is there like an easy metric of measuring is it an effective way is my training effective and i think we've got something pretty good today with a test on isometric mid-type pulls on some fairly high level rugby union players this week's paper is titled isometric mid-type pull correlates with strength sprint and agility performance in collegiate rugby union players so basically what we had was a team of researchers from florida japan nebraska so there is a pretty random correlation or correlation pretty random conglomerate of uh, universities there so basically what they wanted to see was did the mid tie isometric pull did it have any bearing or kind of any strong correlation between these different levels of agility tests? And more specifically, could we kind of correlate it with rate of force development and maximal force development? So what we had was uh, 15 university level rugby players. We had four backs and 11 forwards, if that makes any difference to you. And basically what we did, we had was three different testing sessions. So what we had was we had our strength training testing session. We had our sprint testing session with agility. And then we also had our mid tie isometric pull session. Our strength training session was good old-fashioned high bar 1rm back squat to parallel so they were very kind of conscious about this to parallel they had someone laterally in the squat rack viewing them they had a research with them all time so when they hit parallel they were told up so no one went any deeper than that so we had kind of uh, consistency across all players in terms of depth and squat so they tested their 1rm standard warm-up protocol very reasonable dynamic warm-ups tested their 1rm second testing session then was their maximal sprint performance so they did a 40 meter sprint and then they had two attempts at this so they used a high-speed camera 40 meter dash and then they was recorded to the nearest 0.01 second the fastest time then was recorded for the analysis then we moved on to the agility test so they measured their agility using a t-test and a pro agility t-test so basically what we had was the pro agility test was we had three cones in a line parallel to each other the participants started at the middle cone they ran to the top cone straight back down to the very bottom cone and then straight back to the middle cone as fast as time possible so for the t-test four cones were placed in a t-figure format participants were instructed to start at the first cone sprint 10 meters to the second cone shuffle laterally five meters to the third cone shuffle 10 meters in the opposite direction to the fourth cone shuffle five meters back to the middle cone and then run back toward 10 meters backward 10 meters to the starting cone so if you're any of uh, fitz's one-to-one -one of athletes apparently you'll know what the uh the t-test is apparently uses an awful lot so next up then we had the isometric mid tie pull testing and analysis so simply they had an apparatus that resembled a barbell for isometric pulling rate of force development and maximal force development so participants were allowed mixed grip hook grip or normal grip they were told relax pre-contraction so this was kind of like any to eliminate any kind of pre-contraction forces or any like kind of you know stretch cycling reflex they wanted just from relaxation straight to maximal force development so if they were kind of pre-contracted this would kind of uh would kind of interfere with their rate of force development characteristics and results in that so they need to be relaxed which is very interesting so then they measured this across the rate of force development from not the 30 milliseconds not the 50 not the 90 not the 100 not the 150 and then not the 200 and so then they calculated their maximal force development and then rate of force development from the values they got from this our result section is up next the result section mainly looked at the relationship between one rep max squat performance and their isometric uh, mid tie pull performance, their sprint performance and their isometric pull performance and their agility performance and their isometric pull performance. So one rep max squat had positive correlations with force output and peak force at all the time scales, basically from 90 milliseconds all the way through to 250 milliseconds one rep max squat was also positively correlated with peak force development one rep max squat performance was also correlated with peak force so i think it's pretty clear from these results that like squat is heavily correlated with isometric pull like rate of force development peak force output force output during a kind of broad domain of time the next thing then is sprint performance so sprint performance you still see uh 
in this case what would be a negative correlation between sprint performance and rate of force development it's important to note here that negative correlations are good because sprint times is what's being taken into account so a lowering of sprint times while you increase your rate of force development is a fairly kind of obvious nod that you're getting better at sprint performance so negative correlations between rate of force development and sprint times at 30 milliseconds and 50 milliseconds and not at the kind of later ones so that's 150 milliseconds 200 milliseconds 250 milliseconds it may seem quite intuitive we'll talk about it later as why this might be the case so then peak rate of force development during the isometric pull was also negatively correlated with sprint time which obviously shows that higher peak rate of force development uh, would lead to lower sprint times okay so then agility is the last piece as uh, owen said to you there's kind of two pieces in the agility testing one was a t test one was a pro agility test interestingly we have differing results here so we see negative correlation between uh, agility test times in the pro agility test at 30 milliseconds 50 milliseconds 90 milliseconds 100 all the way through to I think 200 or 250 milliseconds so as you get increased peak force development or peak rate of force development you see decreasing time in that test interesting here though is that in the T test so that four cone pattern where you're running out doing shuttles or, or shuffles across and back uh, we don't see any correlations, be they positive or negative, between kind of rate of force development, peak rate of force development, force output at any of those time frames. Okay, so before we get going, I just want to re read a little quote from the introduction of this paper. And I think it's something, it's very, it's quite a profound sentence, but it should sum up a lot of the reasons a lot of real athletes should be doing strength training supplementary strength training in their off season for instance running velocity and ability to change direction have been demonstrated to be related to strength and power relative to body mass basically if you're stronger you can move better as an athlete and you can do it faster hopefully so i think that's just a, quite a useful thing to be reminded of at all times if you are wondering why you're doing strength training or if you're coaching your athletes like such a, a simple line but it, it sums up a lot of why you should be doing strength training so there's kind of a couple of things about the study, I think. First of all, it's definitely a useful metric if you have, for example, like a large club or you have a certain number of athletes. If you, for example, are unsure about kind of strength training, you're a coach yourself and you're a real athlete. So if you're doing something maybe like you're a field sport or you might be doing something like a martial art, maybe like something grappling or wrestling, and you're trying to see, you know, kind of is your rate of force development going up or your peak force development, and you're not too sure, for example, you know, you're limited by strength or you're limited by a weight class, for example, it might not always be so easy to see an increase in your maximal strength. Ideally, it should be, but there's always times maybe when it's not, or maybe in season when you want to check how your performance is going or how it's increasing, or more likely how your performance is degrading. So over a, a prolonged season or in training period or in season period, the likelihood of fatigue is accumulating is kind of a useful measure to know. So if you were, for example, very diligent with that, you could go from season to season. So, you know, in your on seasons, you had kind of a, a routine uh, kind of like recording points throughout certain time points throughout your season and then you could know then you know you go to your next off season you have another productive off season let's say a rugby player or something like that and then the second on season you use this isometric mid tie pull you get your values and recorders so it's very simple it's very quick and then you kind of see you know ideally you would have a very productive off season you can kind of see hopefully a little bit higher rate of force development maintained you know our rate of uh, maximal force development kind of maintained a little bit higher than you might normally would and it's kind of a good way of judging how your off season and how productive that is and how effective it is in maintaining your on season performance so the other thing about the isometric mid type pull is it's quite simple so you know relatively inexpensive you know if you're kind of a dedicated athlete or you're coaching a, a cohort of athletes in your gym you know it's something that's very simple to do it's very easy uh technique is very low you just pull as hard and as fast as you can and you know it's over in a few, literally it's over in milliseconds so it's a very very short period of time the only caveats i would have with isometric mid ties or any kind of isometric pulls is that they can be quite fatiguing so in terms of you know if you're doing prolonged so if you're using isometric training as a form of training they've been quite fatiguing in terms of like cns fatigue they can be quite hard on joints as well so isometric training is actually very productive for tendons and ligaments if used correctly. However, an overstimulus of isometric training could probably, while it may not damage your tendons and ligaments, it certainly feels quite sore if anyone of you have ever done any kind of isometric training. A lot of times your joints, something like this, it can feel quite sore in your joints, which is not something you want to be kind of, you know, prolonging the effect on. So ideally I wouldn't do this kind of training or isometric testing 
with high frequency so i keep it kind of maybe once a month or even less maybe once every two months something like that so kind of at the end of maybe a training block or at the start of a next training block so keep it quite low frequency i wouldn't use this as a side of training so just so you you think kind of you know do these train these maximal force developments and that's kind of a an argument for a different day or another investigation but for now i definitely think this is a useful metric if you are any kind of real athlete if you want to see how your training is going it's quite simple effective and reasonably cheap if you can get one yeah as garf said these are cheap pieces of apparatus to get like they can go all the way up to you having a a kind of cage bolted to the floor over the top of a force plate which makes it a very not cheap piece of apparatus but for all intents and purposes you can go on ebay or amazon and get yourself a an isometric pull gauge and you literally just tie it to the floor or you stand on a plate and you tie it underneath the plate and you just have a simple t-bar in your hands and you pull as hard as possible into that t-bar and you will get that mid-tie isometric pull uh, so it's very very simple really accessible for the vast majority of populations there's two things i want to talk about in this discussion um, and they're more kind of to do with the paper and to do with certain findings they might have had so the first one is in relation to why we saw rate of force development that at the very very early on so like 30 milliseconds and 50 milliseconds being negatively correlated to sprint time uh but we didn't see it with the later ones right and and it's down to a very very simple thing and it's it's the amount of time your foot is in contact with uh with the floor or the amount of time your foot can impart force onto the floor during a sprint so we see in in most sprinting applications you might have 0.1 seconds so like 100 milliseconds would be a kind of a ground a standard ground reaction time during a 100 meter sprint so when we start looking at 50 meter sprints which were tested here at uh, 30 milliseconds rate of force development is important. 50 milliseconds rate of force development is important. They didn't show up with 100, but it's very, very likely that the ground reaction time is actually shorter during these sprints. Uh, so it makes perfect sense. So me being able to produce a lot of force in 200 milliseconds isn't really that applicable when my foot is only going to be in contact with the floor for 100 milliseconds or less. The second thing is the agility tests and the difference between the findings and the agility tests. So for the pro agility test, we see negative correlations between times and rate of force development, but we don't see it so much with the T-test. Something we're not aware of here is how kind of au fait these players were with the agility tests, how, uh, how relatively regularly they do these tests. So it could just be something as simple as they're more skilled at the pro agility test or movement similar. So like the pro agility test is is basically like a suicide you'd run on a basketball court or a simple out and back drill that almost every field athlete will do. So it's it's more than likely something they're really, really skilled at being able to go and just tap the floor and do a simple turn and run again. So they're not like having to turn and shuffle sideways or anything like that. So it could be very, very likely that they're more skilled in that movement so they can apply more force. And then the stronger athletes are able to apply their strength uh, and get better times in those another option could be that due to the fact the so it's like a 5 10 5 uh, agility test is what the pro agility test is it's a much shorter test than what the illinois t test or in this case just the, the t agility test uh would be so in the t agility test you have forward then you have lateral movement then you have lateral movement then you have reversing so it is it's a very very different kind of movement so it's it's likely that either the the kind of regularity with which they do these drills or the time frame in which the drill is being done or just the relative skill of the players could all have have an, had an effect here and it may not actually be that like you could just have stronger athletes may still be better at the Illinois T test we just don't see it in this paper okay as always, if you want more information like this click on that Seek a Strength button down below make sure you subscribe and you'll see all the videos in our library. Every Monday there's a paper review, so there's loads more papers like this around supplementation, testing, uh, strength training, speed training, jump training, all that good stuff. Every Monday comes out. We have theory of training videos. We have reaction videos. Just go and check out the channel. Hopefully you'll enjoy them if you enjoyed this. If you want to hear more about our coaching, so our coaching for 
like SNC for athletes or for weightlifters or for powerlifters, go to seekastrength.com and you'll see our programs and our consultancy uh, options there. And if you want to find more kind of in-depth conversations around strength and conditioning, general high performance sport topics go to the seek strength podcast you can get it on spotify you can get it on apple Podcasts. you can get it everywhere you usually get your podcasts uh, and go and listen to a few longer form discussions with me with Gurf, and then with some of the best coaches in the world